All right. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, glad to be able to make it uh, safely through the rain. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, or whether you're just passing through, or um, you're new, you're searching for a, a home church to be at, I'm glad that you're here, um, be able to worship together with you. Um, thank you, praise team, of course, media team, um, and Pastor Michael for um, praying for the worship and for reading us today's passage, Word of God. For those joining us for the first time, um, we've actually started through our journey through the book of Esther a couple Sundays ago. Uh, if you were here last Sunday, we had Pastor Aaron covering for me for the pulpit. Um, and so now we're back into um, our journey through the book of Esther. And we'll be uh, wrapping up here in this passage in 13 to 22. So when we began the book of Esther a couple of Sundays ago, we saw from the opening passage, just to give us a background slash reminder, since it's been a, it's been a couple of weeks, we saw from the opening passage of chapter 1, and I encourage you to go through it again, just to peruse it, go through it really quickly, um, the extravagance of the Persian king and the empire that he was ruling, and the reasons why behind his display of extravagance. We saw what life was really like under his uh, rule, King Xerxes, as his word was equal to law. And if broken, most likely meant death, at the very least, prison. We reflected on how, though Christians are living in this world, we are not to be of the world. There is a difference. And does not live as if this world is our home which we learned was to stand and fight. Of course, not in a violent, hostile manner, for the truth of God's word and to live according to what God commands in his word. And we ended with the king, Xerxes, being very angry because his wife, queen, refused to appear before him and the many guests of which he commanded. Now, in today's passage, as as Michael read the scripture reading here, we'll see the king's response in a little bit more in detail. In verses 13 to 15, as we see here in the opening passage of today's scripture, the king consulted or he uh, asked the advice of the wise men, as we hear, read here, who knew the times. Why did he do that? Well, uh, the previous passage, as it ended, King Xerxes was basically humiliated in front of powerful people that he gathered in his palace, people he was trying to convince again to support his campaign, his military campaign against the Greeks. We found, out, out, found that out last time that we were here. And so to upkeep his authority as king of Persia, he can't just simply overlook the queen's public refusal, and so turns to his, quote-unquote, wise men. Now, these wise men were experts in matters of law and justice. Uh, think of them today as um, the, the president's uh, cabinet, his most trusted political advisors. And they were the most closest, they were the closest to the king. Now, closest to the king means this, that they were allowed to enter the king's presence. That means his throne room, uninvited and unannounced. Uh, keep that in mind as we're going to come back to that near the end. Now, these seven were nobles or princes of Persia and Medea who had special access to the king. They can go to him anytime they wanted to and were the highest in position in the kingdom. And we read here that they knew the times. What it means that when they knew the times, it means that they used, um, at that time in the ancient world, astrology and other forms of fortune-telling, such as 
uh, getting a goat or a sheep or animal, and after killing it, opening up, looking at the intestines, liver, other in, uh, things inside to see what to do, what action to take. Those were the type of uh, things that they done back then. Now it's notable that the king turned to legal advice from his political advisors rather than, as I thought to myself, going to the queen himself. And so what does he do? He, he asks his advisors what should be done to Queen Vashti since she did not obey the command of the king according to the law. Um, most likely, um, there wasn't a, uh, a specific law to address this kind of specific situation. So, one of the advisors, as we read here, uh, Memuken, advises that the queen's position be given to another woman, as we read here, who is better than she. Now, most likely, uh, we're not told exactly what this better means, but probably was looking at the context of what happened previously and why he was upset, probably meant more obedience, more submissive. And why did Memuken give this advice? We don't have to go too far. We can go into the text here in verses 17 to 18. We see the reason why. Memukan was the one who gave the advice, but most likely the other six advisors there probably nodded their head in agreement. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. And we read what they agreed upon was that the queen's display of disobedience would spread to every home in the empire. In other words, they were worried. They were a little scared, maybe a lot of scared that the queen's action would encourage all the women in the empire to respond the same exact way as King Xerxes did. I'm sorry, the Queen Vashti did to their husbands. And so Memrican continues in verse 19 as we read here, advises the king, king, you got to make a royal order. In other words, you got to make this into law. And to make it law that Vashti is to never appear before you again and to take away her position as queen and give it to someone else. Again, better than she. Remember, can then continues in verse 20 that if the king does this, he makes it into this into law, then all the rest of the women in the empire, regardless of their status, financially, socially, doesn't matter, will give honor to their husbands. Then we read in verse 19, we read, so that it may not be repealed. For reference, uh, there's a, another book in the Bible called Daniel. Um, in the book of Daniel, Xerxes' father, so the king that we're reading here in today's passage, his father was also king before him. Darius, King Darius, is manipulated by his advisors to make an order that can't be repealed. That means uh, to be reversed. And that, in the book of Daniel, King Darius' decree or royal order was to forbid prayer. Now, it's interesting, as I found out, that from scholars who have studied the Persian Empire, there's actually no evidence that the Persian laws could never be repealed or reversed. So, considering that, this detail of the law being irreversible here in the book of Esther, and as I mentioned in the book of Daniel, actually serves to heighten the tension in the story. Irreversible, can't be repealed, law has to be obeyed to build this tension in the story. Um, but it doesn't only serve to heighten the tension, that's not the only purpose, but it also reveals the arrogance of the king. 
including his advisors. As they think that they can somehow control circumstances by making their orders to be irreversible. Just a thought from there is that this is a great example of the limits of human reasoning. It also made me wonder if Memukan gave this advice to the king as an opportunity to make things easier for him in his own home. And the reasoning behind that is as I looked at uh, verse 16. It seems like he is taking the queen's action of disobedience as an opportunity, as he says in verse 16, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, the focus here, but also against all the officials, which Memukan is an official, and all the peoples who are in, the, in all the provinces of King Nahasuerus. It looks like Memukan is afraid that Queen Vashti's response would encourage other women to respond the same, starting with his own wife, starting with the king's seven advisors. So it would seem that to achieve his own personal goal, he manipulates through rhetoric, through the situation, to make this incident into an empire-wide law. Then we see in verse 19, we saw Memukin's advice to make a royal order to take Vashti's position as queen and for her to never be able to appear before the king. And he says what would happen in verse 20. In other words, when the women see the consequences of Vashti's action, they will be intimidated into honoring or, in other words, respecting without question their husbands. Then in verse 21, as we read here, after hearing this advice, what is the king's response? It pleased him. He liked what he heard. Instead of thinking through what his advisors were telling him or advising him to do, instead of contemplating, oh, what might be the major impacts or consequences of this decree and order, he just simply says, I like it. And the other advisors like it too. And the king did what Memukan proposed. And so in verse 22, we see the action taken by the king. We read that the king sent letters to every province of the empire. And if you remember, if you were here a couple weeks ago, I showed a little graphic of a picture of how big the Persian Empire was. It was pretty, pretty massive. It was a big empire. It was sent to every province in the empire. In other words, everybody. That it was law. It was law given by the king that, as you read here, every man be master in his own household. As you think about that, as I thought about it, what, what was achieved with this royal order? What was achieved with this this new law, supposedly, was the social order of Persia really threatened by Queen Vashti's one woman's resistance? But even if it were, can such a law be enforced by a royal order? Are all men to exercise power in such a self-centered way as Xerxes did and then expect instant obedience? And is every man supposed to Banish his wife if she fails to submit to his will at any given time. Now, there's some irony here, and if we kind of find out as well, uh, we can't help but chuckle here a little bit, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's ironic that when King Xerxes made this royal order into law, he actually made it aware to everyone in the empire. Um, when that incident happened with Queen Vashti, he was at his palace in um, 
probably the main capital out of the four in Susa. It happened there. I mean, again, remember, the empire, empire is huge. But through his own decision from Memukan's advice, he essentially made sure that everyone in the empire heard what happened, his humiliation. Right? Can't help but chuckle a little bit. What he meant to inspire respect for himself and all husbands, his actual effect may have been humiliation or further humiliation instead. Again, if only he thought about just a little bit what his advisors were saying instead of just taking it on first hearing. Or, as I thought about it, go and apologize to his wife. We'll see throughout the book of Esther, a little bit more as well as we continue on, we'll see that this king, this earthly Persian empire king, has no governmental sharpness or aptitude or capacity even for personal thought. And making judgments. We actually see his general weakness, this king's general weakness in character from the decision made in today's passage. We also see Memukan's view of respect as well and how to get it, revealing the inner workings of Persian power, the Persian Empire's power as sheer force fueled by the need to control. Remember, can fears female quote-unquote disrespect and apparently believes respect can be acquired through force of a royal order. If a man has to command a woman to respect him, then whatever respect that is, it, it loses all meaning. Those who gain respect and obedience only by holding enough power to command and actually live in constant fear of losing it. An empire that looks so powerful on the outside and so vast and so, uh, so much glory and power and wealth, we see actually the inner weakness of it through today's passage. And just for us to be not confused, what I'm trying to say is today's passage is not actually a direct attack on men here today, but actually inside look of the motivations or fears that characterize the ungodly powers of this world. Back then, even today. In other words, for us, it's the world in which God's people must live in. The worldly power of Persia was displayed at the sudden desire of the king's closest advisors who actually manipulated him with skill and rhetoric. The well-ordered empire seemingly run by law, judgment, justice is shown here to be actually driven by a king obsessed with power and glory and the insecurity of the most powerful people in the empire. An order given out of Memekin's perhaps personal anxiety running the empire. We see that this is a kingdom that is run by people in power, motivated by their own fears, their own anxieties, their own goals, which eventually we see here leads to abuse of the power that they have. This abuse of power from people in positions of power wasn't a problem limited to ancient societies back then. Throughout history, there has been those who have risen or, or, or given positions of power and who abused it. For us living here in the United States, because of the checks and balances structure of the government, there hasn't been any dictators that emerged. But it, too, has seen its share of corrupted leaders. Let's go into the Bible. 
The Bible itself, if you read through the Bible, it's full of examples of leaders who held power but used it very, very foolishly. Even Israel's greatest king, King David, used his power, his position, for adultery and murder. Sadly, even the church today is not immune to the misuse of power by spiritual leaders. In both scripture, in the world, and even in the church, we can see that power has always and everywhere had a corrupting effect on those who use it for their own ends. I want to touch upon a couple of things for us today as we try to relate and to apply or to see what ways that we can take away from today's passage. The first thing is we see a certain relationship dynamic amidst the king's decision based on the advisor's manipulation in making a new law. And that is the relationship between King Xerxes and Queen Vashti. In other words, their marital relationship. It was between here in this passage, King Xerxes and Queen Vashti, but for us today, it speaks to husbands and wives. Now let's look at another passage in the Bible. It comes from Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. I'm going to focus on verses 21 to 25 really quickly here today. That speaks about wives respecting their husbands. But I want us to see the difference and how respect from wives is gained compared to here in this, today's passage in Esther is night and day difference. In today's passage in Esther, respect is demanded from the Persian wives by order of a royal law. In Ephesians 5, in God's word, respect is to be Hope you see it, the response of a wife toward her husband, who loves her as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. And these instructions here for wives and husbands are given, if you look at verse 21, on the context of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, wives and husbands are to serve each other, following the example of their Lord, Jesus Christ. Do you see the difference of attitude here? Of the man toward his wife in Ephesians 5, compared to that of the men in today's passage in Esther chapter 1. I speak to myself as a man and as a husband. And to all the men here, we must not allow misunderstanding of the teaching of God's word, and we definitely must not allow erroneous teaching to influence us, to justify the misuse of God's word and thus here in power. Like my word is law, how dare you, not that type of attitude. Also, we must not ignore our responsibility for self-sacrifice for the good of our wives. The men in today's passage made it law to demand respect and obedience from their wives, which shows that they actually were not worthy of it. Again, I speak to myself first and foremost. We men must not demand respect but to live and serve our wives where we are worthy of it and ask ourselves, am I being more like Christ? Or maybe am I being more like Xerxes? And for those who are not married and you're pursuing marriage, that that's something that you can remember as well. But not just to the men here today. I speak to any person who holds any type of power, whether that's temporary or consistent, to hold it like Jesus. Whether as a husband, 
or wife, an employer of a business of 500 or 5,000, or any other positions of authority, we, as Christians, are responsible to resist the temptation of misusing the power that is graciously given to us in that position for personal gain. We could easily end with that, but I pray that we do not leave today with just thinking, oh, right, husband, wives, husbands, don't do that, right? No, Uh, we must uh, not get lost in the details. While the details are good in God's word, we gotta continue to see the big picture. Actually, we gotta continue to see God in this passage, in all the passages that we read. So let us continue to keep God in focus here. Specifically, I believe this passage for us today shows that God's kingdom is not like the empire of King Xerxes' kingdom, nor of any worldly kingdom, in the past, now, or in the future. We are invited, I believe, to see the similarities and also the big differences, I pray that you see, of the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. God, too, is a great king whose royal orders cannot be challenged or reversed. God's sovereignty also governs all things, great and small, and everything in between. God, too, must be obeyed, or we will for sure suffer the consequences. But God's law, his commands, is beneficial for men and women, for us. It's actually good for us, unlike the drunken desires of a man who gets manipulated by his advisors. And God graciously invites us into a loving relationship with him. As mentioned, the seven advisors had the privilege to appear before King Xerxes in his throne room, what, unannounced and uninvited, right, if you remember that part. For those who may not know, back then, especially in the Persian Empire, if you did appear unannounced and uninvited, you would be at the mercy of the king. You can't just like open the dorm room and say like, yo king, I want to talk to you real quick. You couldn't do that. Because if he didn't want to see you, you could end up in prison and again, you might be executed, maybe even on the spot. In a similar way, we too cannot approach the throne of God's room in his presence on our own. We can't. Our sin doesn't allow it. What if it ended with period right there and that was it? What if that was it? Oh, we can't enter God's throne. We can't enter the presence of God. We can't meet with God because of our sin, period. Done. No, there's no period there. It, just, it continues. But Christ, God the Son, came down from heaven, leaving the perfect fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, laid down his life for sinners. All of us. The person that's preaching to you in God's word, I'm part of that. So that our sins can be forgiven. But it doesn't end there. Not only are our sins forgiven, Christ gives us his perfect righteousness. What he does is he wraps us in his perfect righteousness. It's like giving like clothing of righteousness on us. Because even though our sins are no more in Christ, We still need the perfect righteousness, again, which we can achieve to appear before the throne room of God's grace. Church, this is the kind of power Christ the King exercised to bring us back to him to have a relationship with him. not to misuse or abuse 
to gain personal goals or, or, or personal aims or ends, but righteously for the Father's glory and for our good. I hope you see that, for our good. For those who have gone through the book of Mark, the journey through Mark with us, if you recall, if you remember how Jesus taught his disciples about what the kingdom of God was like, which they had a completely opposite idea of power and leadership. Jesus, the King of Kings, strongly, I would, I would, I would be very confident in saying it, that he, would, he would strongly disproves the type of leadership shown here by King Xerxes. And by any king, any president, any world leader, and even, even church leaders that misuse or abuse their given authority and position. And those who have led and lead by exercising their authority to demand something. In contrast, we see the leadership of Jesus was not motivated by his own personal fears or his anxieties or his goals that he was trying to achieve while he was on this earth, but by the needs of those he governs as king of the universe. Why would we not be happy to humbly submit to Jesus as Lord and follow his commands? And for us to ask ourselves, who is my king? Who is my king that I submit to? Who is my king that I follow? Church, I pray that we see this world, like the Persian Empire uh, centuries ago, wants us to make it slave. It wants to make us slaves. What it does is it offers us, it offers us the shiny things for submission to its ways. Perhaps the successful life, depending or according to its own definition. And so I honestly and humbly and kindly ask you here today, are you here today enticed or perhaps even trapped from the worldly kingdoms, this world's kingdoms, empty promises that eventually leads to destruction? And perhaps for those who are here saying, well, I'm not following some type of world's kingdom, so I ask of you, for those who may be thinking that, perhaps are you trying to build your own and trying to follow yourself as you sit on the throne? And I ask of us this morning to turn away from this world, to turn away also even from yourself and turn to God. We go to Christ, rest in his finished work on the cross on your behalf in repentance and faith. And we live according to Christ's commands, not the world's commands or even your own commands, but Christ's commands as given in Scripture, which gives us wisdom and joy and life. We continue to follow Christ, even though you may see, you may feel, you may hear even, that it may seem better to just follow the world or even follow yourself. I pray that we remember Christ's love, that we remember the grace of God towards you, towards us. I pray that we remember, again, that this world is not our home. At this time, we'll take some time to pray in response to what we have just heard from God's word this morning. For those joining us for the first time, simply going before the God in prayer and responding to him in prayer. Perhaps there's something that you heard throughout today's sermon 
to his word. I pray that you will not simply ignore it or brush it off. Whatever it may be, I pray that you will go before the Lord with it. Perhaps it's a question. Perhaps it's confession. Perhaps you're confused. Perhaps you're not even sure what to say. Perhaps you want to go before in silence. Whatever it may be, the Lord welcomes you in his grace. So would you go to him at this time? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I come before you, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, if it wasn't for Christ, we would never be able to enter your presence, your throne room of grace. So Lord, I pray that we be reminded of that and how special that is that we're able to do so, enter into your presence. God, creator of all things, creator of me, creator of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. But as we have heard from your word this morning, I pray that you help that you help us see more and more the difference in this earthly world's kingdoms and desires and Lord, your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to continue to look to you. Lord, we're very forgetful people. We have our tendencies, Lord, to look at the things that this world offers and go after it, or perhaps even resistant to get off to our own thrones that we're sitting on. Help us, Lord, to see that your kingdom is so much better that your commands given to us are for your glory and for our good help us remember you as we submit to you God in Jesus Christ name we pray all these things Amen